Welcome to the third session of South Lakes uh, Connecting with Our Community Series. Uh, this evening's feature uh, sessions uh, feature three presentations, Going Wheat Free, Packing Your Suitcase for Surgery, uh, South Lake Without Borders. So it's easy to, um, to understand why we're having the first session. And if you ever walk through chapters, it's, it's quite easy to think that there's got to be at least a different diet for every day of the week. And this evening's first speaker is Judy King. And Judy uh, is a registered dietitian here at South Lake. And she wants to give you the straight goods on going wheat free while she chews on a steak bone. No, um, <laughs> prepares a quinoa dish. So without any further ado, Judy King, please. Thanks very much, Mike. Thank you. Can going wheat free. Going I have turned my mic on. Can everybody hear me at the back? Yes, Tammy's giving me a thumbs up, so I think I'm good. Thanks very much uh, to South Lake for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here tonight. Obviously, topic I'm passionate about. You're probably wondering, why is Egypt up on this slide? Right, We're talking wheat-free. What has Egypt got to do with anything? About three years ago, I decided to take my daughters to Egypt. Um, it was about October, December, um, and we made plans. And about January, we were going to go in the spring, about January, I thought, I'm going to get fit. I want to be able to go down into those caverns that you could see in the pyramids, climb the pyramids, not be out of breath. I want to be physically fit. My older daughter and I, we started running January 1st at about 5 o'clock in the morning. We ran, it was freezing cold, but we did it. And I got fit, and we went to Egypt, and I have to let you know, it was the Arab Spring. We literally went just after the revolution. And it's a brilliant time to go because there's no one there. We had the pyramids all to ourselves. It was really, really great. So that fitness start led me on the path that I'm here uh, to today. Because I spent, <coughs> I spent that spring getting healthy, exercising. I spent that summer doing more boot camps and getting healthy, but I, I just couldn't get rid of an extra 20 pounds or so that I wanted to get rid of. And although I felt good, I thought I might be able to feel better. That fall, I heard a CBC radio uh, show with um, Dr. Williams, Dr. Dr. William Davis, pardon me, and it was so funny because one of our surgeons also heard it and he got in the book that I'm going to talk about Wheat Valley. And he said, you know, we're always talking nutrition. And he said, you know, have you read this, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I hadn't. So he, he actually got me a book by the next day. He wanted me to read it so badly. I picked it up and I read it. And that fall until December, I followed it religiously. And I'm not a fad diet person at all, at all. But it, it changed how I feel how I've been able to live my life, and this is just my testimonial, right? This is just me. But I want you to know that story about me, because it's been about a three-year journey. So diet of the minute. There are constant diet of the minute, diet of the hour, diet of the month, diet of the year. It's not new. For a better start in life, start Coca-Cola earlier. People have been slinging food stuff at us. It'll improve your health, the cookie diet, the grapefruit diet, the cabbage diet, forever and ever and ever, right? So before we get into further, I need to let you know, and this is pretty serious, the disclaimer is um, I can't talk to you one-on-one -on -one and give you diet information. I'm, nothing that you should take away should be, Judy said this, I got to do this. This is what worked for me and some, some information that I read, but you really need to go and do research on your own. You need to talk to your doctor. You need to talk to a dietitian, especially if you have diabetes or anything on top. This is just information to take away that is general information. If you want to go further with something, do some research. Most of the information comes from wheat belly and grain belly and my own personal experience, right? So I'm not advocating, I'm providing information. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes or so, and then I'm going to put together some food, and for the other 10 minutes, I'm hoping I can just a answer questions for you and see what you want to hear about. So tons and tons and tons of diets. Anybody ever been on a fad diet? Put your hand up. I'm amazed that half of you haven't been on a fad diet. Anybody just ever changed their diet, followed a different diet, even if it wasn't a fad diet? Put your hand up. Okay, okay, I knew I'd get you there at some point. We modify our diets, we make changes, that's perfectly great. The upside is, sometimes, in fact, a lot of the time, people lose weight. 
even on a fad diet, in the beginning they lose weight. And I think it's because you make a change. If it's a cabbage diet or a cookie diet or whatever weird thing it is, a grapefruit diet, it makes you change your current habits. So you may lose weight, you may change your diet, you may start reading labels, and those are good things, right? You may start paying attention to portion size, and those are good things. The downside is, for most people, what happens to the weight? Does, it comes back on. It doesn't stay off. Because eventually, you can't follow the fad diet anymore. How many days can you eat grapefruit or cabbage soup or cookies or whatever it is before you just can't do it anymore? So for most people, the diet uh, doesn't work long term. Downside is you also usually have to buy something. Go to the library and get the book. Don't necessarily buy the book. Go online. Um, the downside is sometimes it removes everything from your diet and you get left with a green bean. That's all you can have. You know, you're removing whole food groups and things and that's not great, right? The downside is there can be bad things. People have harmed themselves with bad diet information. I love this old one. I don't know if you can see it in the bottom. The tapeworm diet. <laughs> You will lose weight. <laughs> no kidding, you will lose weight. So, um, why, who wants us to follow a fad diet? Who benefits when we follow a fad diet? <coughs> Just shout it out. Yeah, people that manufacture the goods. People that make the nutraceuticals, the vitamins, the minerals, the products, the bars, the um, TV dinners, the books, the videos, all of those things. The, the food companies, there's billions of dollars to be made by pumping out another diet. Lots and lots of money to make. Are they caring about what's in your best interest? Not all the time. Profit driven. Can I sell you, as a dietitian? can I sell you my cookbook? No, I can't. Can I sell you vitamins or minerals? No, I can't. It's a conflict of interest in my college. I can't promote something to you for profit to myself. It's a conflict of interest. Um, McCain's or uh, some drug company or whatever, there's no conflict of interest, right? They can do that, so be wary of that. So I would say keep calm, forget fad diets. That's not what I'm, if you want to talk about something, run something by me, feel free. I'm hoping that what I present is not a fad diet, but just a healthy way to eat. So what was our diet meant to be? Common sense to me says, if I was a person, a, a human body, our human bodies have not changed genetically a whole lot. If I was a human body running around in um, Central Africa or uh, the Middle East, how many millennia ago, I would have had meat, possibly fish, I would have had berries, I would have had some fruits, I would have had some ground vegetables, I would have had some grains, I would have had some nuts, and I would have had some seeds. Right? Makes sense to people? Would I have had any of these things? No. No, these are human manufacturers, human made foods that wouldn't have been available. Was sugar readily available? Was any sweet source of carbohydrate readily available? Were bread goods readily available? No, they weren't. Um, and I'm going to argue that continually we've been putting these things more and more and more in our diet when they really shouldn't be there. So what should we be eating? Probably lots of vegetables, some meat, some fish, some poultry, some eggs, small amounts of dairy, nuts, seeds, some fruits, small amounts of grains, okay? These are the two books that I'm talking about. Again, lots of other sources of information. You don't have to buy them, but I just want you to know where um, I got my source of information. So Dr. Davis talks about weed as being the pariah, as being the thing that you want to avoid, and I just want you to understand the why behind that. Wheat used to be a tall grain and used to have small heads on it, was very hard and reacted differently in our body than the heavy head of wheat that we have now. If you think about pictures of people back in the 40s, you know when we saw soldiers going off to war and people were waving their hands? 
and you look at the crowd and you look at the soldiers, they're all thin. They are all thin. Something has happened in our food chain and in the way we eat since the 1930s and 40s. And I think one of the big things is the modification of wheat so that it's a very fast sugar in our bodies. Look at the uh, third bullet down. Two slices of whole wheat bread will increase your blood sugar faster than sugar. And that's all what we're talking about is how your body reacts to the food it eats, how much insulin makes you produce to how much sugar your body thinks is there. The more insulin you produce, the more likely you are to lay fat on your abdomen and have higher insulin levels. And higher insulin levels are thought to be inflammatory as well. So given this, the idea is that you take the wheat out of your diet and wheat is in lots of things. It's, almost, it's the backbone, right? The breads, the cereals, the grains, the crackers, and tons of stuff that we eat. The other piece to be aware of is something called glycemic index. Glycemic index is how much sugar is released from a food product and how much insulin you produce. Some foods you'd be surprised to know are sweet, but just the way they're digested and broken down, the sugar in them is released slowly, like the seven cur second curve, the low glycemic index, and you end up with not very much insulin being produced, and you absorb it nice and slowly without laying on a lot of calories and fat. Sweet potatoes, even though they're sweet, have a low glycemic index. So you can eat sweet potatoes, and chances are not as much of those calories are going to go to fat. White potatoes have a very high glycemic index. So you have white potatoes, your blood sugars will get elevated, your body produces more insulin to deal with that, and you can, pr you can put on more calories. Okay, any questions on that? just made it as clear as mud. Yes. So the question is, do, are smaller potatoes lower in starch? The smaller new ones, are they lower in starch? Um, <coughs> not that I'm aware of. Um, some things like bananas, the longer they sit out, the more simple the sugar becomes. So an, an unripe or close to being unripe banana will have less of that or fast sugar than a really ripe banana. I'm thinking that's probably the same, but both of those food products will, will um, cause a fast rise in carbohydrate in your system. So I'm not advocating, we'll go into a little bit more detail, I'm not advocating gluten-free just wheat-free and some other food-free pieces. Gluten-free products can be just as high in sugar, just as high in um, uh, high glycemic foods as anything else. So that's not necessarily the way to go. So what do you need to eliminate? For the first three months, I basically took all the wheat out of my diet. No pasta, no breads, no crackers. I also dropped rice, cereals, um, Oat products, corn, corn-based products, all sugar. Sugar is just really a no-no in terms of what I took out of this. I enjoyed lots of vegetables, unlimited. <coughs> Sweet potatoes, um, nuts, healthy oils, quinoa. When you follow this kind of diet, you don't care about fat anymore. You stop caring about fat. Fat really, if you're not eating in the presence of sugar, fat doesn't have a bad effect on your body. Studies have shown that people who, like me, follow this kind of diet, you can actually lower your blood cholesterol and raise your HDL, which is your good cholesterol. Again, you have to read the book, you have to decide for yourself. Um, cheeses, I don't do low fat cheese, I do full fat cheeses, they keep me full avocados, I had an avocado today, lots of olives, and limited amounts of juice because they are simple carbohydrate can put sugars up, limited amounts of fruit, dairy products. I'm a vegetarian, I don't eat meat, so I do have lots of legumes and beans in my diet, um, chocolate, sugar-free foods, etc. And not at all those things. I bend that a little bit for me because I find my weight will actually go too low if I don't have some of the, the fatty foods, the fattier foods. So what did that mean for me when I did that? Again, it's just a personal. 
Um, I lost the abdominal weight, the sort of truncal weight that I didn't want to have, and I was working out hard before that, but it came off. I used to have headaches in the afternoon. I would probably take, I'd go through a bottle of Advil, you know, I don't know, every half year or something, and at some point my daughter came to me and said, the Advil's expired, and I realized that I hadn't used any. Those afternoon, evening headaches that I occasionally got, I never get. I just don't get headaches anymore. The two o'clock snooze, you know, like I'm, I'm crashing, doesn't happen. It really doesn't happen anymore because I'm not getting the, um, uh, the carbohydrate that way through the afternoon. Um, so for me, again, it's been, a, it's been a huge health choice that I keep going with. So this is a typical day for me minus the meat. I would have egg, I have a lot of eggs. I would have eggs and, and cheese, uh, maybe an omelet with spinach or some other kind of sauteed vegetable. I have cottage cheese, thick Greek yogurt, plain, um, with fruit, berries, nuts, chopped apple, that sort of thing. A meativore could have ham and eggs. You're just not having the toast, something else with it. You can see my typical lunch. Um, dinner, actually at lunch today I had chili that I just had in the slow cooker and made. Um, typical dinner and typical snacks. There's no need to be hungry, there's no reason to be hungry because you can eat as much meat, vegetables, again, and fat, full fat cheeses, full fat meats as you want. So it's a difference, right? It's a difference on the way that we're all taught to eat. Um, what you're not going to do you're not just going to go out and do what I do because I presented it here today. <laughs> you have to make up your own mind. It's not enough. A 20 little minute blurb is certainly not enough. You need to do some more reading and some more research. You know you best. You may look like a kitty on the outside, but inside you're like a lion, and I don't know that about you. Um, you need to talk to your do doctor, especially if you have diabetes, you're taking medications before you make big diet adjustments. You really have to take that into consideration. Tips to make the change, again, I'm going to say it again, read it, know it's good for you. You have to make a plan to change. When I decided to change my diet, um, I had a lot of reading done. I decided what potentially my meal plan was going to look like. I still had kids in the house, so I couldn't get rid of all the stuff that I didn't want to eat. It was still there. There was cookies and there was bread because my girls weren't interested in doing this at all. But if it's just you and a spouse or a family that's willing to do the whole thing, then start getting rid of the stuff that could be your downfall, right? Have things in the house that follow the guideline that you want to. Stepwise change is okay. Some people can do things all at once. Some people need to do it little bit by little bit. So either way is fine. Um, Pre-prepare and cook in bulk. And I think this is good no matter what way you eat. That last minute, I'm starving, open the fridge, and there's the cheesecake from last night or something, that's, that's tough, right? That's a tough one to avoid. Um, you need to have cut vegetables prepared ahead of time, salads ready to go, chicken breast cooked and in the fridge ready to go, boiled eggs that are there and ready to go. That's how I kind of do it so that I can make sure there's something that I really choose to eat that's good for me that's always available. Otherwise, I'm going to be starving and I'm going to grab whatever. Um, when I started this, I truly was starving for about the first week until that craving, and it really is a metabolic craving for carbohydrates, until I got that out of my system. I must have eaten like a liter of cherry tomatoes a day. I just kept popping them because I was like, I have to have something. So carrots and cherry tomatoes and olives and cheese were my snack. So it does take a while, and it takes a while to get rid of the cravings, but it does happen. And um, I just don't get the same kind of hunger, like shaky that I used to. Okay, so there are barriers, there are visible barriers like the wall and there are invisible barriers to making changes. Um, and I just really encourage you to explore what those are if you want to make diet changes um, and that will help you have some success as well. So I'm going to take questions, but I'm going to throw some stuff together here. How am I doing for time, Matt? You have a couple of minutes. So okay. if uh, what, the reason we're asking you to use the microphone, by the way, so raise your hands, please, only because we're being broadcast and this is going on the archives. So you don't even necessarily have to take notes because the notes are online. So just to let you know. Okay. Okay. So does anyone have any questions for Judy? 
Yes. Judy, I have two questions. One is I saw that you eliminated rice from your diet. Yep. And I'd be curious as to why. And then my second question is, what about um, non-wheat bread like spelt bread or did yeah. you, um, do you eat those and what research did you do about those? Okay. So I, um, so the first question was about, just remind me. Why, rice. why you rice has a rice. very high glycemic index, even brown rice. Surprisingly, the fiber doesn't change the glycemic index. So white bread and brown bread are about the same in terms of your body's response to the sugar. It's healthier because of the fiber, and the fiber is good for you, but it doesn't change the glycemic index. So white rice, brown rice, they're both very fast, and um, you have, your body has to produce more insulin to to um, to be able to metabolize them. Um, different bread like spelt bread in the in the book here that I've referenced the he doesn't make much reference to some of the other grains um, I would there's a really good site it's the Australian uh, glycemic index site it's a great website for glycemic index so something like that I would just for you, but just throw that in and see what the glycemic index is, and you'd like it to be under about 45. It's a, you can throw anything in there, and they pretty much have it. Um, myself, I was just interested in, I'm not into those kind of grainy breads, so it wasn't of interest to me. Yeah, I just took them right out. But it could be, it could be really a possibility. So what I've done, quinoa is a grain. Who has had quinoa? Put your hand up. Oh preaching to the converted. So it's a wonderful grain. Um, as you know, really low glycemic index. There are a couple other grains as well, but this one is easy. It's my favorite because it's really, um, I find it's really easy to cook, whereas some grains are mushy in no time at all. This one doesn't go mushy. So what I put in is fresh parsley, fresh mint, um, some chopped apples, some roasted almonds, some red peppers, uh, and cucumbers, a lot of cucumbers, which are really, really good. And then I'm going to do some olive oil to help hold it together. And remember, we don't care. We don't care about fat. It's a good oil. We have a question over here. Good. And I'm going to just squeeze. I have just alcoholed my hands. Judy? I'm going to squeeze some fresh lime over the top. Judy, um, I've been told that... Um, where, where, where? Sorry, because I can't see because the mic. Thank you. To go gluten-free is uh, good if you have Crohn's disease or celiac or um, ulcerative colitis. Is that true? Good question. So for celiac disease, it's a must because someone with celiac disease is, in fact, has a um, sort of an autoimmune reaction to gluten whether it's gluten in wheat or whether it's gluten in oats or whatever it is. And for them, it's actually um, crucial because the long-term effects of not following that are really can be devastating. For someone with Crohn's or colitis, there really isn't any great evidence to support that. Um, that being said, um, I would want someone to really be careful if they were real. Some people are just really um, wanting to do it. I'd want to be very careful that they were still having um, a wholesome diet. And you certainly can without wheat in your diet. But I would say that there's no research to support that people with inflammatory bowel disease, which is Crohn's and colitis, have to or should. What Does else? anyone have any other questions for Judy? I'm all beautifully limed up here now. Is this recipe going to be available online? No, and it's just me tossing oh, some stuff okay. together. Can we sample it? Anybody can do this. I don't have any salt, which I usually would add because I love salt, but it's salt free. So there you go. And I will add just a few green onions, not so much. So ideally, something like this, you would like it to sit in your fridge for, you know, like a couple hours to get all nice and mixed together. But in, in a real cooking show, I would pull out the one that had been sitting and plop it here. And, and then have a good. sip of wine and, yeah, it's oh, the galloping you. gourmet. Remember him? Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start dishing this out. <clears throat> and uh, You're dishing out in these? Yeah, Matt's going to come over and, and help. Okay. I 
think with most things, you have to really want to, right? You have to be invested in the change, but also you have to see the physical benefit for yourself. Um, for me, and it won't be for all people, honestly, for me, do you want to do this, Tammy? Thank you so much. For me, there was a, an actual physical change in how I felt. Um, to not, I used to, when I got hungry, I used to get what I call metabolically hungry. I got physically shaky, you know, that kind of shaky, like, oh, I have to have something now that doesn't happen anymore. My tummy rumbles, I get hungry that way, nothing more. Um, you know, to not have the headaches, to feel like I have huge energy, to be able to do what I want to do, to just lean out <coughs> was just really, really good, good for me. So that keeps me doing it. I was in Cuba, hence the tan. This past week, I had pina coladas, I had margaritas, I had dessert, I had wheat, I did it all. It's not an allergic thing, it's not going to hurt me long term. I enjoyed it, totally. But now I go back to eating how I know is good for me, right? What do they say? They suggest that when you cheat, do it on purpose and cheat on purpose. Is Absolutely. That right? Cheat on and purpose. En and, and enjoy it. And I ran. Like, I, I run. So I ran when I was in Cuba. And then I come back and I go, okay, it's going to take me about a week to stop wanting all that stuff again. But then I'm going to do that and it'll be fine. Great. Judy, uh, thank you very much thank for your, you. Uh, your feedback yeah. today. And, and uh, let's give her a round of applause. Oh, thank you.